So good morning and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today I'm joined by the lovely Eric Jensen, who is based in Salt Lake City in Utah. Um, welcome today. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so, so Eric has, um, has just been telling me a little bit about his life story. He is currently the Chief Strategy Officer for a company called Predictive ROI, but he started his first business when he was actually 14 years old and then spent 10 years actually paying his way through university and traveling around the country with his brother. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more of your story, Eric. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, maybe an unusual uh, start to, to life, but yeah. yeah. It was a ton of fun. It was a ton so, of fun. So tell me a little bit about that. Let's start with that, shall we? So 14 years old, what, what on earth possessed you to get into starting a business? Uh, well, so uh, even by, by that time, uh, my brother and I, uh, we, had, we had developed several ways, biz- businesses in, in air quotes, uh, right? Um, you know, everything from hauling wood and water at campgrounds to... Uh, helping people with chores to you name it in order to, uh, to bring in a little bit of money. Both yep. he and I have always been kind of set on that. Um, and then a friend of ours uh, taught us how to, uh, to juggle one, one weekend when we were camping. Uh, and we thought this is brilliant. And we were already uh, out with our folks and, and working for them. And we're like, hmm, what if we do this? And so we, we went out, we tried it. We were terrible, just absolutely <laughs> terrible. Um, we had literally learned that day and, and, but we made like 25 bucks and we're like, oh yeah, you know, at 14, we're like, this is pretty all right. Um, and it was a whole lot better than the the zero that we were making working for our folks. So, uh, so yeah, we, we decided that we were going to try that. Um, and what started off as kind of a, a lark ended up being something that we, we actually did for, uh, 16 years. Uh, 10 of it, we actually did. Um, that was, that was our sole income. And we traveled all over the country, uh, performing at different events and colleges and, um, for businesses, you name it. Um, and it was, it was a ton of fun for anybody, for anybody that loves to travel. Um, it was, it was great. And, and, you know, I, I love to travel. Yeah, fantastic. And so was there a particular kind of act that you did? I'm just really fascinated by, you know, what you did to, to support yourself for 10 whole years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, I, yeah, it's, it's probably, like I said, it's, it's not the, probably the normal background for someone yeah. uh, in business. Uh, but I will say performance in general is something that comes in handy on a regular basis. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so we did, we did performances. It was mostly comedy. Uh, we actually timed it out one time in a, uh, in a 20 minute performance. Uh, we, we generally, uh, juggled for about three minutes and 46 <laughs> seconds. Um, so most of it was talking, engaging, um, you know, getting, getting the audience to, to enjoy being there. Uh, and again, I, I think that those, those are all lessons that are pretty deeply ingrained now. Uh, and, and they certainly help even in circumstances, you know, like this, Yeah. So, but we, we did that somewhere in the neighborhood of about 3000 times. Wow. That's amazing. So tell me a little bit more about your, your, yourself, just so our viewers can get to know the Eric behind the mic. So you can you give me a professional and a personal best that you'd like to share with them? All right. Well, the, the, the personal best, honestly, I, I know that I kind of like talked about it a little bit. Um, I mean, there's always, you know, the fact that I've got a wonderful wife, a wonderful son. Um, I consider myself extremely lucky on that front. Uh, but really, truly, I, I do look back on those years traveling around the country mm-hmm. and it was awesome. I got to meet all sorts of people. I got to, to see all sorts of pieces uh, of the country that I would never otherwise get to see. Um, and I think that that sort of perspective is also invaluable in life. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that was pretty cool to be able to do that. And, um, so yeah, I, from a personal side, I still really, I enjoy that story. I enjoy that section of my life. Um, from a business success, this, this might seem really, uh, like flippant or not very deep, but honestly, every day, what I'm grateful for is the amazing team that we have here at Predictive ROI. And I'm saying that as a business success because that hasn't always been the case. It hasn't been that way every step of the journey. Um, And the difference between having the right team and everybody is just in the right seat and it's 
it's just things are firing versus when it's not. Yeah. Uh, it's a significant difference on what it means for you, both on a business side and, and even on a personal side. You know that we talk about at EOS, you know, doing what you love with people you love. And I think you're absolutely right is when you've got the right people around you doing the right things in the right seats. It's just a, it's a game changer, right? Oh, it's, it's incredible. It's mm. just incredible. So grateful all the time uh, that, that we're lucky enough to, to have that. And, and we also know the hard work that goes into actually making that, that concept or that dream, uh, which I think most business owners have uh, a reality and, and, and it is a journey and it's, it's not a straight line. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, so predictive ROI, this actually wasn't your business, was it? Um, so you came into it. So there was an original founder. Is that right? Tell me a little bit. Yeah. About that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my business partner, Stephen Westner, he is the original founder of Predictive ROI. Um, but he and I knew each other even before uh, Predictive was founded. Um, we you know, bumped into each other on several different instances. Uh, he was working at the, the uh, Small Business Development Center uh, at the time when we first met at the university that I was going to. And so uh, we had a chance to really work together pretty closely on a couple of awesome projects. There was a startup competition at Duke University. There was uh, a nonprofit where he was sitting on the board at the time that I was doing some work with. Uh, it was just really, really cool um, to be able to experience uh, and learn from someone who had his acumen in, in business. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to... to uh, spent some time with him early. And then as the business started to grow, uh, I was one of the, the first people that he gave a call to. Mm. And how so, long ago was um, that now? Oh, gosh. Uh, so it's been, I think, 11 years, 11 yeah. years, 12 years, something like that. I lose track. <laughs> it, goes, <laughs> it goes by so fast. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, so it was pretty great. And, and when I first started, I was uh, obviously, like I said, I was already uh, running my own business. I was making a decent living. Um, but I really, I love the idea and the opportunity of working alongside someone that I had a ton of respect for. Um, and, and to put that in perspective, I, you know, when, when I say that I had a ton of respect for him, when I was doing that, that startup competition, he tapped his own personal network to be able to find investors to come and sit down and walk through the business plan. Not investors who were interested in necessarily investing in it. They were they invested in different types uh, of things, but but they were able to give the mindset, the sort of questions, the sort of pieces that an investor was going to be looking for, and and it just really impressed me. Like, wow, here's someone who's doing this for a student, hmm. like. That, that to me shows a ton of integrity. It showed a ton of caring and compassion and really wanting to see others succeed. Um, and so when, when he gave a call and said, hey, I would like to see what it would look like to work alongside of you, um, really the, the logistics were the biggest question in my mind, uh, yep. not whether or not he was the right person uh, to be walking alongside. Wow, that's that's fantastic to have that kind of feeling right to the beginning. So it was a startup company. I mean, you were employee number two, if that's right. So, and yeah. you know, all these busy business incubators, like when I used to work at the Ice House, people come in there and they have this expectation that you're going to get this beautiful kind of hockey stick growth and it's just going to go take off and <laughs> everything's going to be wonderful. And 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 sadly, as a, as a um, advisor at the Ice House, we often had to kind of break those dreams a little bit and just explain to them that it wasn't probably going to be quite like that. Um, but tell yeah. me a little bit about your journey. You know, from where you are now to, uh, well, from where you started from, sorry, to where you are now. Yeah. Uh, so good, good point about the hockey stick growth. In fact, for many startups, the reality is the hockey stick is you start here, you go down and then it's flat <laughs> from there. Um, so, so yeah, um, we, uh, we definitely, we started off uh, focused as an SEO agency. Um, because that's, uh, that was Steven's background. He'd written a book on it. Um, and that's where the uh, original impetus for the, the business had come from. Uh, but both he and I had visions for something a little bit different and we really wanted to grow. We wanted to do big work and, and we love doing that. 
uh, me personally, I, I like nerd out on business strategy. I could, I could talk about it all day. Uh, you know, much to the disappointment of my wife, but I, I would, I would go off about it all day if I could. So, yeah. um, so we, we really started to aim for things along those lines and, and, you know, there were a lot of bumps along the way for sure. As far as our growth, in fact, one of the early ones, and you and I, had, you know, kind of talked about this a little bit before, before we hopped on, um, you know, we made some really bad judgment calls in the beginning. Of, of where to spend our time, our energy, and our resources. And uh, probably the most impactful one was we wanted to throw an event. Uh, and we're like, okay. And we got big name speakers. We rented out the hotel. We got the catering. We, we got the, you know, the, the ad in Success Magazine. We had the, the right board of directors to be able to help get us and connected with the right people. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we sold two tickets. Oh, no. um, <laughs> I was waiting yeah. for the what we had. That sounds great so far. What, but yeah, it sounded so good on paper. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and we walked away from that experience a uh, quarter million dollars in debt. Wow. Uh, which at the beginning with a startup, it, it, and again, this was, not, this was not coming from investors or anything along those lines, right? Uh, this is out of, out of pocket. And that was like a punch to the gut. Mm. Um, so... I, we, we get viscerally <laughs> and we still remember, and maybe we still have some scars from that, uh, that experience, even though it's been, uh, it's been years and years and years and years, um, what it's like to, to work through a struggle, uh, with a startup stage of business. Mm -hmm. Um, but out of that, we learned a really, really valuable lesson. Um, and that is don't rely on other people's platforms and authority to sell your services. Right. And that's because, how things have morphed in the business. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, you were about to say, because, because what? <laughs> oh, because uh, your, your list is your most valuable asset as a business. Yes. It really is. Um, and, and again, I know that might sound trite, but um, if you lose all your clients today, if you have a strong list, you can go get more. If you lose your entire team tomorrow, uh, as long as you have a strong list, you can go and, and, you know, uh, find, find the right staff to be able to come in. And if you have to, again, sell to new clients, but without that list, uh, you're, you can be in a world of hurt real fast. That makes perfect sense. And so that was really how the um, predictive ROI kind of changed its model. Is that right? In terms of what you were offering and the Tell me a little bit about what, what effect that had. Because first of all, losing, sorry, losing a quarter of a million dollars, you know, that, that in itself is, is horrendous, but what did, and you have to learn from it, but what did you take from it and where did it propel you forward into? Yeah, so what it, what it propelled us into is really getting serious about building our own platforms. Um, and what we found is over the years, uh, and, and we continue to learn, we continue to use ourselves as guinea pigs all the time, right? Uh, but what we learned is uh, other people really wanted that same expertise. They wanted help to be able to do the same thing. Um, and so over time, we really pivoted and, and decided to firmly plant our flag in, in building platforms of authority and monetizing those for our clients. Um, and it's been, and, you know, again, anybody, anybody who thinks that business is a straight line, um, either had a very unusual experience, uh, based on, based on all, all of the business owners I know, or, uh, or they're just at the beginning of their journey. Right. And, and so they haven't had to zig and zag just yet. So there were a lot of permutations on that journey as we kind of figured out what that was going to look like. Um, but you know, when we look at where we are today, oh man, I can, I can see, the fingerprints of that initial experience all over the philosophies that, that we really hold near and dear, uh, the, the advice that we give to our clients and the strategies and the tactics that we put in place to hopefully make sure no one ever experiences that same pain uh, that we did. Um, yeah. Because uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't wish that. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It's it's just not fun. Yeah, I think we, you know, it's often what um, drives our purpose. I've had a similar experience myself where I lost everything in a business and and was yeah. doing what I just wasn't enjoying. And I was thinking, why am I doing this? And uh, it was a, a significant event that happened, but it sort of made me realize that life is just too short and you need to be mm. absolutely passionate 
passionate about what you're doing, doing what you love. Not saying that, you know, you can necessarily take your hobbies and turn it into a business, but you've got to actually really enjoy what you are doing day in, day out. You've got to, you know, have that. And for me, it was about making sure nobody ever went through what I went through in losing that business and losing that that big chunk of cash as well. Certainly, the more you can lean into the pieces that you love and the work that you love to do, um, the easier every day gets. Um, now, that that's not to say that uh, I have ever yet experienced the day where all I got to do was the things that I love, right? There are there are always things that come up where I'm like, oh, that's not my favorite thing to do, or oh, I guess I'm you know I, I'm the one that needs to do that. Um, but, but the more and more time that I've been able to spend in that, that areas, uh, the areas that I love doing. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Life, life does get significantly better. So tell me a little about the work that you do at Predictive ROI. I mean, tell us what the, you know, what is it that the, the clients that you work with, the kind of work that you enjoy doing, how you help clients in the business? Oh man, you're opening the floodgate here. I, I will okay. do. I will do my best <laughs> uh, to keep it succinct. So, uh, so we we help agencies, coaches, and consultants build a position of thought leadership and monetize it. That's 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 the the long and the short of, of really what we do, because uh, we think that most businesses look at sales from the wrong end of the funnel and they make it way harder than it needs to be and way. Uh, way more difficult and less successful than it needs to be as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we do, you know, we've done research ourselves. We've done primary research. We've studied a lot of research that's out there. Um, if a company has uh, a position of authority, their sales cycle shorter. Yeah. They keep clients longer and they can charge more. Mm. All of that is wonderful stuff. Right. As a business, I don't know that any of us would go, man, I don't want any of that. Right. <laughs> yeah. So all of those are good things. Um, and, and, but it, it's not necessarily a straight path to get there. And I think probably the easiest example of why that works is, um, you know, if, if you have, uh, you have to go in for heart surgery, do you go to the heart surgeon or do you go to the generalist? Right. Yeah. Everybody knows the, the answer surgery. inherently of where they would go. Um, and, and, you know, whenever we think about our own problems, whether you're serving B2B, like we do right? Or whether you're, you know, B2C, you're solving a problem, you're, you're fulfilling a need. And, and so the more narrow you are on fulfilling that need and the clarity that you represent um, and the way that you can address that challenge or, or uh, whatever it happens to be, the better, because it takes away doubt and doubt is ultimately what kills sales. Okay, so you're working with businesses to help them understand um, that niche that they're going to be going after and how they can actually then position themselves as a thought leader in that space. Yeah, and then and then get the systems in place to yeah. turn it into a machine hmm. um, because that's a that's a big struggle uh, for a lot of companies is how do I get it all done? Yeah. Um, and then you have to have the right processes in place to be able to get it all done. And there are, uh, again, I, I could... I could talk about this for hours, but there are, there are all sorts of processes, tools, tactics, and strategies that you can put in place um, to leverage your time yep. in a pretty significant way. And I suppose the same applies to business too. So I'm kind of keen to hear, you know, in your own business, um, we've talked about having the right people and how important that is, having them doing the right thing in the right seat is important. What about your internal kind of systems and processes? <laughs> so many of them. Okay. Yep. Uh, but I'll, I'll actually, I will use this conversation as an example, right? Yep. So uh, one of my roles here at the team is that I go out and I share uh, a little bit about what we, what we do and I do external teaching uh, on a regular basis. Okay. Um, so that's, that's part of the reason that I'm here. Yeah. I, I, I am not the one who goes out and finds everything. That's yeah. part of the process, right? We've got defined where um, I can actually be helpful, who I can actually be helpful with, and the places that I'm really not going to be helpful. Sure. Okay. Um, because for us, like when I'm talking with you, I want to make sure that the sort of audience and the sort of uh, business owners that you're helping can actually get value out of what it is that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So we have what Pam Slim calls a peanut butter and jelly relationship, right? Complimentary and non-competitive. Okay, so- Ooh, Just hold on a second. <laughs> You're good. 
that's my dog. Um, obviously, somebody's just walked into the office and I've got my dog in the podcast room, which I thought nobody would notice, but now they know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should keep it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably stay on there. That's all good. But anyway, <laughs> just didn't want okay. to interrupt you. Okay, so sorry, yeah, carry no, on. So peanut, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so you've got that. Um, and, and then after this conversation, right, um, our, our team is going to take this and they're going to transform it in a bunch of ways. It's going to turn into blog posts. It's going to turn into emails. It's going to turn into social media. It's going to turn into all sorts of different pieces. Um, and all of that is all part of a process that we put in place for slicing and dicing content. Now, again, we're not doing that because, you know, we want to, to take anything away. That's actually a win-win for, for you. And it's a win for us, right? Because we're going to promote the heck out of this thing. And we're going to make sure that, that this is in front of as many people as possible. And, and so that's the sort of content that a lot of teams, a lot of businesses fail to actually leverage. Mm -hmm. This time is being spent either way. Yeah. This conversation is being had either way. And it's good to do these things. Like you have to be doing these things, but what else are you doing with it? Um, you know, another example that's, that, that I like to use is think about all of the emails that you've written over the years, explaining processes, mm. answering questions, yes. describing exactly how something gets done, or maybe it's just the overall philosophy, the 50,000 foot view of a strategy. We've all written those. We've all done that sort of work. And then we hit send, we pat ourselves in the back and we walk away from it. What a waste, right? You yeah. just put all of this time and this effort into creating something that's truly useful. Yep. And then we let it sit. We just put it under our digital bed and it gathers dust and it's never seen again, right? And so part of it for, for a lot of businesses, uh, and this is, this is really what we help them do, is we, we take all of those smarts that they've got and we help them actually get it out to the world and we help them actually develop the processes that they need to, to make sure it gets done. Yeah. Because otherwise, if I tell someone, just take those emails, they're gonna be like, awesome. <sighs> Oh God, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, what, what do I do with do it? it? Yeah. <laughs> what, what is this going to look like? When does this have to be done? Right. And, and so then it takes us what should be a simple thing and it turns it into this monumental task and they're like, oh, put it on the pile of to do's. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas if you have the right process in place and the right people are actually in the right positions along that process to get it done, it is amazing. It is amazing how much you can push through a business quickly. Yeah. I always talk to, with the clients that I work, that we use a thing called Delegate and Elevate, which I think comes from Dan Sullivan, which is around thinking about where you really add the most value and then looking to get other people to do the things where you don't add value or where you right. just don't even like it. So like, if you don't like something, why would you put yourself through um, the grindstone <laughs> of doing it, feeling miserable about it and getting into that downward spiral when there are people out there who probably love that stuff and would be really, really great at it. Right. Like the last thing you want me doing is yeah. graphic design, right? I <laughs> yeah. mean, I maxed out at stick figures. <laughs> so the team loves him to tease me about it. But, but I mean, like I could, I could do the work if I absolutely needed to, I could do it and I could make it look pretty decent, yeah. but it's going to take me 10 times as long. Mm -hmm. And, and it's probably still not going to look as good yeah. as having that right person with the right skill set in place. Beautiful. Hey, what other lessons have you learned through your journey in building your business? <laughs> oh man, there's, there's tons and tons of lessons. Um, but, but I think really the biggest ones, uh, you know, like I said, figure out how to leverage your time. Yep. We all have the same amount of time in our days and the more you can do at that time, the better. Yep. Stop doing the things that you suck at. And instead find or hire the people who are really good at the things that you're bad at. Don't hire, don't hire people that are like you, no. right? Because if they're just like you, then they're going to have, you know, similar skill sets. And we do see that happen. Um, so, and then the other thing is run towards the pain. Okay. Yeah. So if Talk you have that a little bit more, yeah. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so if there is a particular challenge that you have in serving your clients, yeah. or there is a particular challenge that your clients can't overcome. 
run towards that pain. Because if it's a pain for you, it's a pain for your competitors. So odds are pretty good. You're going to put yourself in a good competitive advantage if you can solve the problem, right? For yourself internally. And if you're running towards the pain that your clients have and solving that for them, then you're their white knight. You can come in and you can, you can say, I can take care of this. It doesn't have to be a problem anymore. We have the solution. Both of those are pretty good things to have, right? Competitive advantage is always good. And being able to be, uh, be the right fit for your clients to solve their problems and do it well and do it efficiently. That's, that's what we're all in business for, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So in terms of, you know, building this whole social proof for your clients, can you give us some tips around things that people should think about? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, building social proof. Um, so that, uh, th- this is like perfect, right? This, so this yep. goes right towards the running towards the pain. Yep. Uh, Stephen and I would be the first ones to admit, uh, we were really terrible at this. Oh, really? Like we were really bad, like super bad. Um, and, and so it, we never did it. Um, we did a really bad job of actually gathering case studies. We did a really job, bad, bad job of gathering testimonials. We did a bad job of actually collecting, you know, the, the, um, social media posts or the emails or things along those lines where people are like, you guys are awesome. We're working with you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and this, this isn't like me patting myself on the back, but, but we got those things. Like we did good work and we did just a terrible job of actually collecting them. And so, and on top of doing a terrible job of collecting them, we then did a terrible job of actually taking that collection and getting it out to the world. So even if we had it, we didn't actually put it anywhere. Right. Um, And so again, what we realized was this just isn't our skill set. And so we have, we have members of our team that are great at this. They're great at being able to go and make case studies they're great at being able to go and do interviews and, and get the, the feedback from current clients and from exiting clients, things along those lines. They're, they're great at being able to take that and actually getting it out on our social media platforms and putting it into our emails and all those other sorts of pieces. Yep. So when it comes to kind of the, I guess, the, the basis of building social proof mastery, there's really two stages. The first one is, you need to define where you're getting communications that provide the sort of proof that you want. Okay. Right. Yep. So remember social proof is just any sort of proof that comes from a third party. Mm-hmm. This could be awards. This could be accreditation. This could be the businesses that you currently serve. Uh, like we mentioned before, case studies, testimonials, just kind words, you name it. Yep. Okay. Um, so understand the places where you're actually getting these from and make sure it all goes into one place. Ah, yeah. I know it, it, like this is it almost feels like a no brainer. <laughs> it does, um, but it's not things of, you think about. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Right. Just create a database of all the goodness and it's like, okay, well that shouldn't be that hard. Um, and it's not that hard as soon as you say it out loud, but we didn't do it. Um, and it doesn't have to be complicated. See something great on Facebook, screenshot it. Have, get a great email from somebody, screenshot it, right? Um, I, I recommend getting screenshots where you can because it gives context of where it is. Oh, yeah. um, and it also it also does make it so that you can't be like, I just made this up myself because I wrote it, right? <laughs> um, so getting screenshots is always good. Yep. Um, and, and, and then once it's all there, so if you've got awards, put the images for the awards in there have the logos for the awards organization, whatever it happens to be, right? Get it all in one place. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of it is try to empower, if possible, one person on each of your channels. Now you might have one person who, who manages multiple media channels for you, right? They might be managing your video. They might be managing your social. They might be managing your email uh, individually, or they might be like, well, there's one person who handles all that. Okay. Um, but give them ownership of that and say, look, we have given you this great, this great set of content 
And then what we want you to do is we want you to utilize this content at least X number of times in this period of time on each of these platforms. And it's not gonna be, we want you to use it every single communication. That's gonna be weird, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> just like you're bit, bragging yeah. yourself. <laughs> yeah. okay. But you might say, look, we want you to make sure that it goes out at least once a week on every single platform. Yeah. That's it. And honestly, if you do those two things, build the database and then empower someone with sure. clear instructions on how to utilize it, mm -hmm. you will absolutely turn around how you take advantage of your social proof. Wow, yeah. Okay. And that doesn't even get into how you can use it on your website and all that other sort of stuff, but I know we have a lot of time. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose, you know, for people like me who kind of go, yeah, that is just brilliant. You know, that needs to be done. Um, but we don't have the time to do it. This is where your team can actually step in and help. And I assume you have a sort of a done for you service that enables people to go, can you help us with this? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so our team is really, really good at that stuff. Uh, yeah. We call, you know, those are our turnkey clients. Um, we, we also have, uh, members of, uh, of, of our community authority sales machine. Um, and, and then we have what we call sprinters. That's more of a 90 day, uh, like deep dive intensive with some clients. Um, so it, it depends on what a client really needs, but yeah, I mean, as far as being able to get those systems in place and understand it, yeah, our team is really good at building systems. And for a lot of these systems, we've done them literally thousands of times. So for instance, let's say this video, or if you have a podcast and you're like, oh man, I got the thing. I did the recording. Now what? Right. Mm -hmm. We've done that thousands of times. Yeah. Right. Or I've got primary research. What do I do with it? We can show you how to slice and dice that for a year. Right. Um, you know, uh, or man, I do all of these, this, uh, this writing and it's really great. And I am, and it just kind of sits there. Don't worry. We, we know how to put that all together and start actually like, yeah. So those are the things that we do. Um, yep. and, and, and it's fun. Um, but we are, we are dogged about system, um, because we know without system, it just doesn't get done. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because I know when I first start working with clients, we talk about um, developing their systems and processes. They worry that they'll become sort of very mechanical, very um, McDonald's-esque in terms of it just becomes this is mm. how we do it. But I always talk about the fact if you can systemize the predictable, then you have the chance to humanize um, the opportunity or the potential. Because if you know this is the way you're going to do it, then you have the opportunity to add the value around it in terms of how do I actually now make this, you know, exceptional and humanized. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would, I would add a, you know, another analogy to that. Mm -hmm. Let's say, well, we'll use the juggling. What the heck? We'll use oh, that as yeah, our analogy. Yeah, great way to finish up. <laughs> you, <can laughs> you can use any skill set here, but what the heck? We'll use the juggling. Yeah. Um, when you first learn it, your whole goal is to do the exact same throw yes. 10,000 times. True. Like the right hand throws the left hand, the left hand throws the right hand. There's no difference. In fact, you want it to be as uniform as possible. Yes. Okay. And until you get those fundamentals down, good luck doing anything else. True. And, and for those people to go, well, I just want to start doing tricks right away. I want to be really cool right away. It's like, that's fine. Uh, but it's not going to happen. Right. <laughs> so instead of saying, I'm not going to learn the basics because it's going to be basic. Yeah. All I want to do is go to uh, be awesome. Instead say, how about we get really good at the basics? Cause guess what? We're going to have to, so that we can get faster to being awesome. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, and, and that's, that's true of any skill set that you're going to put in place in your business. Make it a process first, get really, really good at it, mm -hmm. and then start to modify and riff on it. I love it. That's absolutely perfect. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm juggle myself and my husband's actually a juggler as well. So, oh, but I know, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know, but that's it. But, but I, I know how difficult it is and you're absolutely right. It's all about consistency. And once you've got that right, then you can start to do really fun things, but yeah. Right. 
hadn't even thought of it like that. Thank you for explaining it in that way. <laughs> that is brilliant. Well, I'm just I'm just happy to know that I'm on with a fellow juggler. That that makes it even cooler. Uh, so. my, my husband is pretty good. I'm pretty average, but he 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 used to actually go to all the juggling conventions around the world and got really into it. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Well, who knows? Maybe we ran into him at some point. <laughs> who knows? Hey, look, we could no doubt talk all day about life, the universe, business, and everything, but sadly we're running a little bit out of time. Um, really great tips there. Love what you've shared. Thank you so much just if anybody wants to get in contact with you what is the best way for them to get in contact with you Eric? yeah you bet okay uh so there are probably uh the the best two ways that i think uh for someone to be able to continue to to chat with us yep. um one is and again i know you can always go to linkedin there's like ten thousand eric jensen's though so beware that oh, okay. uh but you, you can always find <laughs> uh you can always find predictive roi on, on linkedin you know facebook and all those other usual places but um really if you want to want to get a better idea uh we have a free weekly q a just oh. hop over to our website. It's right on the banner, or you can go to predictiveroi.com forward slash QA. Um, sign up and it's awesome. There's a great community that we're there every week. We do 10 to 15 minutes of teaching on a topic and then open it up for everybody to ask whatever burning questions that they've got. And whether it's us answering it or whether it's other members of the community, it is fun. It's actually what I look forward to most in the week. Um, and then for anybody that's really interested in understanding what a position of authority truly means, mm -hmm. um, they should check out our book. It's free. And when we say free, we really mean free, not like secret shipping and handling. Um, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. we've like, we've even shipped these things to like South Africa. It cost us a couple hundred bucks in order to make sure that it arrived in the right place and, uh, all that. So all you got to do is go to predictiveroi.com forward slash free dash book, and you can get sell with authority. Um, and it's, it's a pretty quick read, but it is super, super helpful. And, and really it's the basis for what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think it can act as a good, uh, jumping off point for anybody that wants to, to, to go down that path. Oh, that is really generous. And um, I'm looking forward to having a look at it myself, both the q and awesome. and the book. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. join. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to. I've just got to work out the time zone, but I'm sure it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> it's all right. I, I work with EOS across the globe. And so we're often, um, we're actually just doing our QCE. They were in Vegas this last time round. So I think I was up at 2 a.m. in the morning to join them oh. for the day. So it's pretty normal. <laughs> that is dedication right there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look, thank you so much for your time it's been an absolute pleasure having a chat to you getting to know you um, really appreciate it and look forward to keeping in contact likewise deborah thank you great thanks very much bye-bye